Reading Rhinos presents Percy Jackson and the Olympians, Book One, The Lightning Thief, by Rick Riordan. Chapter One I accidentally vaporized my pre algebra teacher. Look, I didn't want to be a half blood. If you're reading this because you think you might be one, my advice is close this book right now. Believe whatever lie your mom or dad told you about your birth and try to lead a normal life. Being a half-blood is dangerous. It's scary. Most of the time it gets you killed in painful, nasty ways. If you're a normal kid reading this because you think it's fiction, great. Read on. I envy you for being able to believe that none of this ever happened. But if you recognize yourself in these pages, if you feel something stirring inside, stop immediately. You might be one of us. And once you know that, it's only a matter of time before they sense it too. And they'll come for you. Don't say I didn't warn you. My name is Percy Jackson. I'm 12 years old. Until a few months ago, I was, I was a boarding student at Yancey Academy, a private school for troubled kids in upstate New York. Am I a troubled kid? Yeah, you could say that. I could start at any point in my short, miserable life to prove it. But things really started going bad last May, when our 6th grade class took a field trip to Manhattan. 28 mental case kids and two teachers on a yellow school bus heading to the Metropolitan Museum of Art to look at ancient Greek and Roman stuff? I know, sounds like torture. Most Yancey field trips were. But Mr. Bruner, our Latin teacher, was leading this trip, so I had, I had hopes. Mr. Brunner was the middle-aged guy in a motorized wheelchair. He had thinning hair and a scruffy beard and a frayed tweed jacket, which always smelled like coffee. You wouldn't think he'd be cool, but he took stories and jokes and let us play games in class. He also had this awesome collection of Roman armor and weapons, so he was the only teacher whose class didn't put me to sleep. I hoped the trip would be okay. At least, I hoped that for once I wouldn't get in trouble. Boy, was I wrong. See, bad things happen to me on field trips. Like at my fifth grade school, when we went to Saratoga Battlefield, I had this accident with a Revolutionary War cannon. I wasn't aiming for the school bus, but of course I got expelled anyways. And before that, at my fourth grade school, when we took a behind-the-scenes tour of the Marine World Shark Pool, I sort of hit the wrong lever on the catwalk, and our class took an unplanned swim. And the time before that? Well, you get the idea. This trip, I was determined to be good. All the way into the city, I put up with Nancy Bobo. Bubble Fit, the freckly redhead kleptomatic girl hitting my best friend Grover in the back of the head with chunks of peanut butter and ketchup sandwich. Grover was an easy target. He was scrawny. He cried when he got frustrated. He must have been held back several grades because he was the only sixth grader with acne and the, st and the start of a wispy beard on his chin. On top of all that, he was crippled. He had a note excusing him from P.E. for the rest of his life because he had some kind of muscular disease in his legs. He walked funny, like every step hurt him. But don't let that fool you. You should have seen him run when it, when it was in gelada day in the cafeteria. Anyways, Nancy Boba Fett was throwing wads of sandwich that stuck in his curly brown hair, and she knew I couldn't do anything back to her because I was already on probation. The headmaster had threatened me with death by in-school suspension if anything bad, embarrassing, or even mildly entertaining happened on this trip. I'm going to kill her, I mumbled. Grover tried to calm me down. It's okay. I like peanut butter. He dodged another piece of Nancy's lunch. That's it! I started to get up, but Grover pulled me back to my seat. You're already on probation, he reminded me. You know who will get blamed if anything happens? Looking back on it, I wish I'd decked Nancy Bobo Fit right there, then and there. In school suspension would have been nothing compared to the mess I was about to get myself into. Mr. Brunner led the museum tour. He rode up front in his wheelchair, guiding us through the big, echoey galleries past the marble statues and glass cases, of, glass cases full of really old black and orange pottery. It blew my mind that this stuff had survived for 2,000, 3,000 years. He gathered us around a 13-foot-tall stone column with a big sphinx on the top and started telling us, about, telling us how it was a grave marker, a stele, for a girl about our age. He told us about the carvings on the side. I was trying to listen to what he had to say, but it was kind of 
it, because it was kind of interesting, but everyone around me was talking, and every time I told them to shut up, the other teacher chaperone, Mrs. Dodds, would give me the evil eye. Mrs. Dodds was this little math teacher from Georgia who always wore a black leather jacket, even though she was 50 years old. She looked mean enough to ride a Harley right, through, right into your locker. She had come to Yancey halfway through the year when our last math teacher had a nervous breakdown. From her first day, Miss Dodds, Mrs. Dodds loved Nancy Boba Fett, and I figured, and figured I was the devil's spawn. She would point her crooked finger at me and say, Now, honey, real sweet, and I knew I was going to get after-school detention for a month. One time, after she'd made me erase answers out of old math workbooks until midnight, I told Grover I didn't think Mrs. Dodds was human. He looked at me real serious and said, you're absolutely right. Mr. Brunner kept talking about Greek funeral art. Finally, Nancy, Nancy Bobblefit snickered something about the naked guy on the stell. And I turned around and said, Will you shut up? It came out louder than I meant it to. The whole group laughed. Mr. Brunner stopped his story. Mr. Jackson, he said, Did you have a comment? My face was totally red. I said, No, sir. Mr. Brenner pointed to one of the pictures on the stell. Perhaps you'll tell us what this picture represents. I looked at the carving and felt a flush of relief because I actually recognized it. That's Kronos eating his kids, right? Yes, Mr. Brenner said, obviously not satisfied. And he did this because... Well, I racked my brain to remember. Kronos was the king god and... God? Mr. Brenner asked. Titan? <laughs> I correct myself, and um, he didn't trust his kids who were gods, so um, Kronos ate them, right? But his wife hid baby Zeus and gave Kronos, to a, Kronos a rock to eat instead. And later when Zeus grew up, he tricked his dad, Kronos, into barfing up his brothers and sisters. Ew! said one of the girls behind me. And so there was this big fight between the gods and the titans, I continued, and the gods won. Some snickers from the group. Behind me, Nancy, Nancy Bobblefit mumbled to a friend, like we're going to use this in real life, like it's going to say on our job applications, please explain why Kronos ate its kids. And why, Mr. Jackson, Mr. Brenner said, to paraphrase Miss Bobblefit's excellent question, does it matter in real life? Busted, Grover muttered. Shut up, Nancy hissed, her face even brighter, brighter red than her hair. At least Nancy got packed, too. Mr. Brunner was the only one who ever caught her saying anything wrong. He had radar ears. I thought about his question and shrugged. I don't know, sir. I see, Mr. Brunner said. Mr. Brunner looked disappointed. Well, half credit, Mr. Jackson. Zeus did indeed feed Cronus a mixture of mustard and wine, which made him disgorge his other five children, who, of course, being immortal gods, had been living and growing up completely undigested in the Titan's stomach. The gods defeated their father, sliced him to pieces with his own sith, and scattered his remains in Tartarus, the darkest part of the underworld. On that happy note, it's time for lunch. Mrs. Dodds, would you lead us back outside? The class drifted off, the girls holding their stomachs, the guys pushing each other around and acting like doofuses. Grover and I were about to follow when Mr. Brenner said, Mr. Jackson? I knew that was coming. I told Grover to keep going, then I turned to Mr. Brenner. Sir? Mr. Brenner had this look that wouldn't let you go. Intense brown eyes that could have been a thousand years old and had seen everything. You must learn to an the answer to my question, Mr. Brenner told me. About the Titans? About real life, and how your studies apply to it. Oh. What you learned from me, he said, is vitally important. I expect you to treat it as such. I will accept only the best from you, Percy Jackson. I wanted to get angry. This guy pushed me so hard. I mean, sure, it was kind of cool on tournament days when he dressed up in a suit of Roman armor and shouted, What ho! and challenged us, sword point against chalk, to run to the board and name every Greek and Roman person who, ever, who had ever lived, and their mother, and what god they worshipped. But Mr. Brenner expected me to be as good as everybody else, despite the fact that I have dyslexia and attention defi deficit disorder, and I had never made above a C- in my life. No, he didn't expect me to be as good, he expected me to be better. 
and I just couldn't learn all these names and facts, much less spell them correctly. I mumbled something about trying harder, while Mr. Brunner took one long, sad look at the stell, like he'd been at this girl's funeral. He told me to go outside and eat my lunch. The class gathered on the front steps of the museum, where we could watch the foot traffic along Fifth Avenue. Overhead, a huge storm was brewing with clouds blacker than I'd seen over the city. I figured maybe it was global warming or something, because the weather all across New York State had been weird since Christmas. We'd have We'd had massive snowstorms, flooding, wildfires from lightning strikes. I wouldn't have been surprised if this was a hurricane blowing in. Nobody else seemed to notice. Some of the guys were pelting pigeons with lunch bowl crackers. Nancy Bobblefit was trying to pickpocket something from a lady's purse. And, of course, Mrs. Dodds wasn't seeing a thing. Grover and I sat on the edge of the fountain away from the others. We thought that maybe if we did that, everybody wouldn't know that we were from that school. The school for loser freaks who couldn't make it elsewhere? Detention? Grover asked. Nah, I said. Not from Brunner. I just wish he'd lay off me sometimes. I mean, I'm not a genius. Grover didn't say anything for a while. Then, when I thought he was going to give me some deep philosophical comment to make me feel better, he said, Can I have your apple? I didn't have much of an appetite, so I let him take it. I watched the stream of cabs going down Fifth Avenue and thought about my mom's apartment only a little ways uptown from where we sat. I hadn't seen her since Christmas. I wanted so bad to jump in a taxi and head home. She'd hug me and be glad to see me, but she'd be disappointed too. She'd send me right back to Yancey, remind me that I had to try harder, even if this was my sixth school in six years, and I was probably going to be kicked out again. I wouldn't be able to stand that sad look she'd give me. Mr. Brunner parked his wheelchair at the base of the handicap ramp. He ate celery while he read a paperback novel. A red umbrella stuck up from the back of his chair, making it look like a motorized cafe, cafe table. I was about to unwrap my sandwich when Nancy Boba Fett appeared in front of me with her ugly friends. I guess she'd gotten tired of stealing from the tourists and dumped her half-eaten lunch on Grover's lap. Oops, she grinned at me with her crooked teeth. Her freckles were orange, as if somebody had spray-painted her face with liquid Cheetos. I tried to stay cool. The school counselor had told me a million times, count, count to ten, get control of your temper. But I was so mad my mind went blank. A wave roared into my, in my ears. I don't remember touching her, but the next thing I knew, Nancy was sitting on her butt in the fountain, screaming, Percy pushed me! 